Week three, which should be week four, but I was not here last week, and I assume you weren't also. <laughs> the, uh, this idea of lead me. So we've extended now this series for another week, but what's it to you? What's it to me? Um, in fact, I've got five points today, and we'll probably get through the first. I'm in no, I'm in no rush, as you know, if you've been here through John. Um, so... <laughs> Psalm 5 won't, won't take as long as John, I guarantee you that. Uh, in the woods, lead me. Let me read the first three verses to you. All right, it's, a, it's a psalm of David, just take note of that, to the choir master for the flutes. Uh, verse 1, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my groaning. Verse 2, give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God, for to you do I pray. Verse 3, O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice, in the, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you, and I watch. And I watch. Let me pray. Father God, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for these people, uh, for this church, for this family. Thank you for uh, your protection this last week. Uh, I pray for those who are still um, recovering from the storm in whatever, whatever shape, whatever form uh, it's affected them. Um, that you put them back on their feet as soon as possible so they, they can rejoice and exult <clears throat> in you and in your doing in their life. Uh, Father, we lift up Joyce to you this morning and uh, just ask for your uh, protection to be covered over her and that you would restore her heart to normal health. We thank you for all that she is to this church and to this church family. Father, I want to know what it means to watch. I want to know what it means to watch in our prayers and our sacrifices. And so I, I trust that you will reveal that now to us. In your son's name. Amen. Anyone here still without power? Just, just my brother in the back. Do you, do you look out the window hoping to see an FPL truck? Wycom? That's your cable company? Or so. <laughs> So Wycom was like a uh, FPL company from, say that again, yeah, out of state company. Out of state company. And they looked at your, they looked at your post and like, yeah, he's, there's no hope. <laughs> did you cry or did you groan? <laughs> and you probably went back to your living room window and just, on the windowsill, just watching for the next FPL truck or Wycom truck. Or that's good, man. That's really good. So, everyone else with power, you'll survive. You'll be all right. It's just gonna be. So what? I got power. I'm gonna and I'm gonna utilize it. The uh, I, I, I mean, everyone here lose power. Did anyone not lose power? Are y'all selling your house anytime soon? <laughs> All right, there's some flood damage. I mean, you get a good price in your house. Well, there you go. Yeah. So then you don't, so you two are exempt from my sermon today. <laughs> because you don't know what it's like to watch for an electric truck come down your, come down your street and hope that they will restore, yeah, your power. And, uh, but everyone else, we got our power back on right after I set up the portable AC unit and the generator in my house. So that was, that was nice. Um, it was, a, you know, we, we pulled out the, the RV um, and connected the generator up to it as a two, three hour process just to find out our generator. My 30 amp plug is a 13 and a half amp 
um, which allows you to plug a 30 amp plug into it. And my AC on my, on my RV requires 13.6 amps. And so it would run it for five minutes, pop off, run it for five minutes, pop off. So then we set up the house, you know, it was like a four or five hour deal. I went out to the church, check on the church to see shingles everywhere. By the way, Steve, thanks for cleaning up the shingles. I know you had nothing better to do. Um, uh, and I come home and the, the power's back on. This is, this is, this is awesome, man. It's great. But when as I was going to church, I saw the FPL truck, you know, and then uh, down my street and they, you know, stuff. I was just like, yes, this is, this is going to be good, man. We, we live next to the Spectrum Tower. So apparently, um, internet's very important. Uh, so, and cable TV. So we will not be selling our house anytime soon. Uh, they, they ran on a generator for five days. Internet's more poor. <laughs> but uh, when I saw the FPL truck driving down Harlock, you know, the excitement was there. You know, you know so I'm driving around, I'm just scanning, where's the electric trucks at? Uh, some of you, you, you know, I mean, you've been looking out your window for how long, watching for the electric truck to come, come down your road six days. Yeah, I mean, outside of Steve, I think you're, you're a second, second there. Um, and you watch. Why do you why do you watch? You don't necessarily sit like they're like a puppy looking out the window, but you are aware of every electric truck within a mile of you, and and you are hopefully you know watching them turn down your road. But you watch because of a couple reasons. You know FPL or the electric companies exist. You know they're out there. I mean you don't see them yet, but you know they're out there. You believe in them. You really do. This is why you watch. You believe that the electric company will will restore your power. You probably starting to waver in that belief, but it, it'll come. Don't don't be like the man tossed to and fro from the winds of Irma. It'll it'll come. But you believe, and this is why you watch. This is why you look. You believe. There's not much you can do about your power. There really isn't. Well, you can get on your phone. And go to the FPL app or whatever and hit the um, I have no power button and send it to them. And um, they know you're without power. I mean, well, they might not know about your situation, but you would, you could let them know by hitting the button on your phone or calling them up. And if you call them up, they might actually be, this, trust me, we're getting a song five. This has everything to do with Psalm 5. They might be sympathetic to your plea, and they, they might understand on their end as they're sitting in AC that you are sweating and, you know, and they might offer words of sympathy. I'm really sorry that you're going through this. We are working the best and the hardest we can to restore your power. In fact, there is a promise that they would, well, not a promise, but they said by Sunday, everyone here should have power. Uh, and, um, and so you get off the phone, and, but yet you might call them the next day. I think you forgot about us. And the next day, you know, did anyone here call FPL multiple times or hit the button multiple times to let them know maybe it's not working? So I get the cross. So I got the crosswalk. I don't think it worked the first time. You know, you wait for the white guy to come up, and he doesn't come up, so you hit it again. But um, I mean, you might call him a couple of times. You saw the FPL truck go by your truck, you know, your house, and they, they surely they don't know. Um, and you watch, and you watch because you believe. You watch because there's a side of you that has faith in them. And uh, unfortunately, I've set you up now to shame you because that side of you is, is the old self that's of no value. That should teach the new self what it means to watch in faith. And I, I, I fear, or I guess I'm concerned, that you haven't been given enough truth or it hasn't percolated down deep within to the wellspring of life within you. To, uh, to move you to a point of watching and believing like we did this week in FPL, watching and believing what God will do in your life. The expectation that he will work 100%. Yes, we may press that button of prayer several hundred times, but we know he's going to show up. And so we watch. And we don't watch wishing FPL will restore our power. We watch waiting for that day to come. This is what you know. The first three verses of Psalm five is referring to, and, and so let ourselves be a lesson to our new selves. This is this is where I want to be. This is where I want you to be, as expectant as you were for your power to be restored. How much more so?
for the power of God to be, uh, to be made known in your life. And so David says he watches. I want to read through Psalm 5, you know, just one verse at a time. And uh, I want to take you down a path that is going to seem, uh, it's going to seem out there. Um, and I, because uh, I want to show you an example of what it means to watch. We got, we got passages in the Bible, uh, be still and know that I am God. Um, well, here, watch. We, we, these passages that seem to indicate that, that we should stop moving in life, that we should wait upon the Lord and therefore become, become inactive. And these passages don't necessarily speak to the life that we're looking at here. You know, the stillness is not, although it could take shape in this life, the stillness, it happens, you know, within you. The watching happens within you. Uh, it's not the watching with these eyes. It's, it's the watching with the eyes of your new life. You know, so he, he starts off, David starts off, Give ear, so I want, yeah, so I want to show you an example of what it means to watch, but you're gonna have to kind of open yourself up to see it. It's not, you hear the word watch, and you picture yourself looking out the living room window watching for the FPL truck, and it's so much more than that. Give ear to my words, O oh Lord. So we just, let's just start there. Give ears to my, give ear to my words, O oh Lord. David says, look, God, I need you to listen to my words. I need you to listen to my words. Uh, my words are telling you that just something's just not right in my life. It's just not right. Give ear to my words, O oh Lord. You know, as we talk about the woods of life, life itself, um, I've heard multiple times, I don't, I don't have the answer to it. The question is, what is the will of God for my life? What, what should I do? What, what, what path do I take? What decision do I make? And guys, and I can't even box in these decisions by you know, health or, or buying a car, this or that. Every, you, you, uh, you're on a journey in this life that the Lord is directing, and you have multiple decisions to make every day. Big decisions, little decisions, decisions of how to react, decisions of you know, what you ought to do tomorrow. Which, which ones are the right ones? Which ones are not the right ones? Uh, which ones are, would lead you astray? Um, and the goal of today, which we will not get to today, lead me in your righteousness. Lead me in the ways that are right. Lead me to the right path, on the right path. But it starts, this, this leading starts with you acknowledging something. And here, well, we just start off with your words, acknowledging to God something's just not right. Your prayers acknowledge God something is not right. In my life, now, I mean, our prayers can be full of rejoicing, thanksgiving, and whatnot, and, and and our troubles and our persecution, which is what David is hitting here. Uh, he talks about his enemies. He's talking about his, um, you know, these these people who are f filled with lies and deceit. But he's turned to the Lord in prayer. Listen to my words. Listen to my words. In other words, he's saying, God. I'm trusting you right now. There's no one else I'm going to go to to give you these words of trouble in my life. And our words, they do reveal to us who we trust the most. Who, who do you direct your words to in your deepest hour of need? And that will, that will reveal to you who you trust in life. And God forbid that God is not in that picture but David says, give ear to my words, O Lord. But let's look at this. Look at the way this thing, uh, he, he structures this thing. Consider my groaning. The words, now he's talking about groaning. The murmurs of my heart. Those, those, those words I don't know how to say. My groanings. I don't know how to, to put it in words, God. But you, uh, you know what I'm saying. The groanings of a heart. The groanings of your life. You wake up and some of you, you, the first sound is a groan. This is a groan of pain. Just getting out of bed. You know, prayer is so much more than just the uh, on the knees, folded hand, close your eyes in that dark closet for five hours. Prayer, I mean, this is prayer. My life is prayer. My, the Spirit praying continually on my behalf. And I can direct my words 
and those sounds that I don't even know how to turn it towards, towards the Lord. But a groan indicates uh, it's just not right. Yeah, so, something's off. You can't even really label what it is. Some of you, you know very well this week. Uh, I mean, we become dependent on electricity. And without AC, I mean, I didn't have it. I mean, I, I had AC pretty shortly after the storm, but there was some groaning. The first time it flickered, oh! Then it came back on, yeah! And it went back off, oh! Yeah! Um, words groaning and then give attention to the sound of my cry. Now he's kind of at the heart of who he is. The cry being the, re the revelation of his pain. I mean, we can cry out with our words, we can cry out with our tears, and we can just cry out, but the crying reveals deep, deep within that there is suffering. Words groaning, crying out. You know, I've, I've tossed and turned on this all week and all last week. And what I'm left with is a mind that looks like the stage, just scattered leaves, scattered ideas, that there's really, you know, the zeroing in is kind of, you know, it's up to God today. But I've noticed that the way David structured this I need you to follow me with, with this real quick. The words, the, gr the words kind of reveal what goes on in the mind. The groaning reveals what goes on in the heart, the cry. Now that's the, I mean, that's the soul. And what David has done, he's shaped his prayer to be everything you are. The old man. And every noise that the old man can make. The old you, right? The you before you came to know the Lord as it cries out, as it groans out, as it words out to be made right. And it's all right. So what we want to do for a second is just take, take that old self and let's just kind of remove ourselves from ourselves for a moment, okay? Remove your new life from your old life, just for a moment. And let's take that old life that's crying out, that is groaning, that is is putting words out there for God to listen to. Let's lay them down on an, on an altar, and let's just step back for a moment. And let's just listen to them. Just, just listen. Listen to the suffering. Listen to the pain. I mean, David is the catalyst for David in this psalm is his enemies. Your catalyst, probably something much different. And just, just watch... Watch your old self for a moment as he lays there and he can't even put words to his suffering. But he knows it's not, something's just not right. And this is why he's groaning and this is why he's crying out and this is why he's, he's talking. He needs to be made right. But righteousness is, is in him but he's not fully aware of that righteousness yet. But you're standing outside and in and, and, and you, you know it's all okay. I mean, there's a, there's a part of you that know it's it, because you know the Lord, because your new birth, you know it's all okay. But there's a second side of you that also seems to not get it. Why does it still groan? Why does it still cry out? Why does it still suffer? Even though I know my Lord leads me in righteousness, even though I am the rightness, the righteousness of Christ, why does it groan? I need to make this distinction before we move on. And like I said, we're going, we're going to take a path through, these, through the woods this morning. That You may not get this morning, but maybe you just grab some nuggets and store it up here for later on in life where it might trickle down and, and nourish that new life in you. But we got to make the distinction that Paul makes. You have an old self and a new self. Jesus makes a new birth you know, that, that is not born of man, but it's born of God. And it's the spirit, it's the life, the spirit of, of God himself is that spirit of new birth. Ezekiel makes it, you know, the dry bones, the dead bones come into life. It's all throughout scripture. You've got two selves. 
The self that's crying out, that's groaning, that is, that is indicating stuff is not right, is connected to the old self, though the new self knows it's all okay. It still groans. You still groan. I just okay. Are you are you following me? If I see, I just want if if you if you're not, that's fine. I, I want to lay this out as best as I can before I move forward. So, in John three, we go to John three real quick. John three. I want to bring up Nicodemus. Nicodemus comes. Nicodemus was a religious man. I want to just continue laying this out as as best as I can before I move forward. Nicodemus is a religious man, okay? He, he's doing things that in the world's eyes are right in, 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 for religion, to connect to God. But Nicodemus is groaning. He doesn't know what to say to Jesus, but he goes to Jesus by night and he basically says, Jesus, something's not right. I don't get it. The... the I don't even know what it is. Here I am, like the, the top of the Pharisees. I'm, I'm leading the worship service. I'm doing all these things for God. I'm following the commandments. I'm a good guy. I mean, at the end of the day, I'm good. And he groans. He doesn't know how to put words to his issue. And so Jesus hijacks the conversation. And let me see if I can pick this up real quick. Uh Jesus responds to him. So Nicodemus, verse 2, chapter 3, uh, came to Jesus by night. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he doesn't even get to his point because he doesn't know his point. And Jesus hijacks his conversation and directs him straight to his issue. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He cannot watch God work. You have to have a new life, Nicodemus. The life that you are living is of no value. There has to be a second person in you. This is the essence of the gospel that I'm concerned has been missed in our churches. You have to be born again. And this isn't figurative. It's not an illustration. It's not a metaphor. This has to happen. The Spirit of God needs to become your spirit, which will raise your dead body back to life. And this is why we spend so much time, and unapologetically, but there's a side of me that's concerned that I'm going to lose you, on on just digging through the Scripture, word for word, to dig up that new life that is heaped under the piles and piles of, of shallow teaching of how to rally our old self, the self that Nicodemus is struggling against, to do good things, to feel better about our Christianity. But Jesus, straight to the point, says it's of no value, Nicodemus. It's, you've got nothing to offer me until you're born again. I have to do something in you. And we go back to John 1.14, and we see, and the word became flesh, dwelt among us, says, da, 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 this is, hold on. But to all who did not receive him, I'm sorry, verse 12, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So there, there's a transition from being a, we could say, a child of the father of lies, the devil, to a child of God, a new life. Who were born not of blood. All right, I mean, he gave the right to become children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so right off the bat, John launches, verse 12, verse 13, that you have to be born again. And he carries it on in John chapter 3, verse 16, with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is like, oh, how can you jump back in the womb? And it's a good question to a man who's dead. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. And Jesus is going, no, 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 you're you're missing it. But Jesus is patient with them. Uh, Jesus said, no, truly I say to you, unless you're born of water and the Spirit, the Spirit... And my Bible's capital S, you know, but it's referring to the, the life that Jesus was living in. The, the, the spirit that he had, his life, which was the spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. Unless you're born of that, you cannot, you can't enter the kingdom of God. That which is a born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. And right there is the distinction of the gospel. 
You must be born of the Spirit. But this is God's work in you. This is God's work in you. And I call you to believe it. To orient your mind, to repent, to turn away from that old self and believe the words you're hearing that God wants to bring you to a new life. I've got, I've got three years of sermons on this on MidtownChurchFL.com or MomentsWithJesus.com. And I encourage you to go and dig through them and, and learn this. Because this is the foundation of your eternal life. This is the foundation that, that separates religion from, I don't even want to say relationship, I want, from unity. Uh, religion from your oneness with God, religion and your new life, there is a fine line of feeling good about your Christianity and being a child of God. And too many, too many focus on feeling good about their Christianity. I don't feel good about mine this morning. I'll be honest with you. It's been a long week. I don't feel good about mine right here, right now. But I, th- that has no eternal weight of how I feel about my Christianity and my behavior. What has eternal weight is what God feels about me. And read the end of Psalm 5, which hopefully we'll get to next week. And so here we are. This is where, this is where the... It sounds weird. I, 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 will, I will say that. It sounds weird because it's foreign. Where I'm, be, I'm separating Hebrews... We read it two weeks ago, right? We, we, we cut to the, we cut the bone and marrow that the Word of God is living and active. Uh, anyone here got this memorized perfectly? Able to, to discern the thoughts. We'll go, we'll get there. When it, when it hits here, I'm coming to it. But so here's what we're doing. We are dividing bone and marrow. The, uh, the heart and the soul. The old man and the new man. The new man is righteous. The new man is right. It doesn't groan. It knows it's okay. The new man doesn't cry out. It knows it's okay. But the new man is cloaked in a body of unrighteousness, with which in John, I believe, chapter 14, the vine dresser said, Jesus says the vine dresser takes that old, the old vines, the branches, the old self, and sets it outside the garden. So there's room for the new life to grow. And so if our focus remains upon our Christianity and how it appears in this world, the new life, it will never, it will never blossom until you, until, until you set aside the old man. And sometimes you have to do it every day. And so we have the old man on an altar. And he's groaning, groaning and he's crying and, and he's wording, he's placing his words out there and the new man, we've got him separated at the very moment. So you can see the distinction because you know, I know you know, deep within, God's got this. It's all okay. But, but we bring the two men together and they're, it's, it's, it's a battle. It's a battle, back and forth, back and forth. And some of you, you're, you're just stirred, you're not at rest and this is where we're going, and fortunately we're going to end it next week, hopefully, he'll lead us into those right places, lead us in his righteousness, so that we can live forever in the knowledge of our new self. And the old self can groan and cry and do his thing, and that's okay. It's okay, David. It's, it's okay, church. Cry out to God so you can watch him. So you can take captive the old man. So you can put the old man into, into chains. And, 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 and to be honest, the old man is dead now. We don't even need to pay him any regard. But we have to because I know very well right here, right now, that he still affects me. And so we have tools such as prayer, groaning and crying out. Habakkuk 2, 1. Well, so he says, um, uh, verse 3 of Psalm 5. 
Oh, Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. He acknowledges, he knows the Lord is guiding him. He acknowledges that the Lord is hearing these, these groans, the cries, the words. He acknowledges that he's okay. You see, you can see it in David, although in the Old Testament we don't have the words old self, new self. You can see the tension in him. I cry out, but I know you hear. Why, why do you cry out if you know he, if he's there, he's hearing? There's tension. And it's, it's okay. In the morning, he says, I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. Which gets kind of weird for the psalm because the, 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 the words prepare a sacrifice could also mean I direct my prayers to you. The Hebrew is kind of loose there. You can, there's translations that use both. I prepare a sacrifice or I direct my prayers to you. And, but I want to say they both fit. They both work. Because my prayers to God is, uh, or is me laying down myself to allow God to lead me. I'll use what the ESV uses, though, sacrifice. I prepare my sacrifice for you and watch. And it's, in the Old Testament time, you might think of a bowl on the, uh, you know, on the altar, you know, slicing the throat and, and letting the fire of God come and you just watch the sacrifice. But I think David's onto something much more. Uh, because Psalm 51, 17, uh, the, the sacrifices of God are a broken and contrite heart. See, David knew that the sacrifice of God is much more than, than what was laying on the altar. The sacrifice was himself. Romans 12, 1. Let me read this to you. I don't, because I don't want to butcher it. Paul says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies. Your bodies. He's referring to this member. He's referring to this man, to this flesh, as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Then he goes on, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, which is what we just basically were talking about. Nicodemus, he needed a new mind. He needed to be transformed that by testing, you may discern, you may be able to watch and see the will of God. What is good and acceptable and perfect. Now we're back to Psalm 5. I prepare my sacrifice for you in the morning and I watch. I watch. I watch. You have to, you have to lay yourself aside. You need to let yourself go. And you need to watch. You need to watch God work. This begins when you understand that you have control over absolutely nothing. You have no control over your next heartbeat. You have no control over yourself and making it home. You have no control over the relationships. You have no control over enough. I'll give you one thing. Your words to the Lord. You can control those. But outside of that, you have no control in this life. So Paul says, here I am. A sacrifice. So I can know your will. How do you, but how do you watch? How do you watch? I mean, be, you can move on from the question, what is the will of God in my life? You, it doesn't, that question has paralyzed so many people in fear because they don't know the will of God and they're so afraid of making a bad or a wrong decision that they, they wait until all uncertainty is removed before they take the next step and by then, They've trusted not in God, but themselves. How do you know the will of God in your life? How do you watch God? How do you prepare a sacrifice in the morning? Watch them. I want to go to Peter. I want to go to Acts 1 and Peter. And I want to show you this, but in in 10 minutes, I'm going to take you down a path. I'm going to just ask you to just take the nuggets, take the passages, and bring them home. Okay? Because it's going to stretch several of you. And some of you, you're going to just scratch your head like, "I I have no idea. And then come talk, come talk to me because this is, could be a one on one at McDonald's or Taco Bell or wherever that's affordable and has power. Okay. <laughs> but how, how, how do you watch? I'll just, I want to show you an example. There's not mechanics here that you're going to take. You're just, I want to show you an example. 
so you can begin renewing your mind and seeing this for yourself, that it can become yours. Not, not imitate the next guy, but that you can understand so you can begin to live in it. But I, I acknowledge and possibly over-acknowledge the fact that I, I, it's going to require uh, some critical thinking on your part. There's a problem in Acts 1. We can't even begin the acts of the, of the apostles until we have solved this problem. There's only 11. There should be 12. There's only 11 disciples. There should be 12. For some reason, 11 wasn't good enough. Jesus is gone, too. You know, There's no turning to Jesus and going, with Jesus, what do we do? Is 11 good? Do we go 12? And so Peter... Let's bridge the gap. The Peter we left in John, denying Jesus, kind of walking along the beach, asking, what are we going to do with that guy, John? You know? And Jesus like, stop worrying, man. The Peter that is a fisherman from Galilee, who when, if you're from Galilee, you were claimed as uneducated, dumb. This Peter takes the bull by the horns. Something switches in this guy. I mean, this is incredible, the, the, the amount of scripture, the knowledge this guy has of scripture. You would never know. I mean, you turn into Acts, you read Peter, you think he's like, he, he's, he's one of the top rabbis or something at the synagogue. You don't think he's a fisherman. You don't think he is, um, he, he's from Galilee. You think he should be wearing the robes and, and be in a position similar to mine and, and teaching the guys. But you know Peter's history. Something, something switched. It's called new life. He began to be powered by the Spirit of God, which gives me hope, gives us all hope. So there's the problem. All right, so Acts 1. I'm going to read through this pretty quick. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive. We don't have it up there. I'm sorry. This is, this is fresh from this morning stuff, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot, Judas, the son of James. There's only 11. All these with one, one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the, mo- the mother of Jesus and his brothers. All right, so here's where I'm going. I want to remind you where I'm going. You pray to God, you groan out to God, you cry out to God, you word out to God, and you watch. How does this, what does it look like? It's going to look different than for everyone. But I want to give you a picture of it. Because it's not what you probably initially think. In those days, Peter stood up. And among the brothers, the company of the persons was all about 120. He stood up. Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. So Peter goes, look, we have a problem. The scriptures have to be fulfilled. Judas has to be replaced. And there's some scriptures that talk about it, he says. For he was numbered among us and and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with the reward of his wickedness and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle and all his bowels gushed out. Lance, I know that's one of your favorite verses. And it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem. So the field was called in their own language, Al-Kadama, that is the field of blood. Okay, get this. All right, this is where we, I, I'm going to push you. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate and let there be no one to dwell in it and let another take his office. That is what Peter's using to make his decision. Judas has to be replaced. And he says, uh, as, as the scriptures, uh, what's, what's his exact words? Brothers, the scriptures had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke before him by the mouth of David. May his camp become desolate, let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. All right? That's what Peter's using as his background. You with me? You have to be at this point. Psalm of David, Psalm 109. It's a Psalm of David. This is the Psalm Peter is quoting off the top of his head. This man who's a fisherman from Galilee just starts spewing out Scripture and, li- and living by it. Uh, let's just see if Judas is in here. Be not, be not silent, O God, of my praise, for wicked and deceitful mouths are open against me, speaking against me with lying tongues. 
they encircled me with words of hate and attacked me without cause. David is saying about something going on in his life. In return for my love, they accuse me, but I give myself to prayer. Now, you could probably insert yourself here. You could probably say, you know, I've had wicked people against me. I've had people lie about me. Uh, they're, they're open against me. They're speaking against me with lying tongues. They encircle me with... You've probably been there to some extent. You could probably take David out and put your name there. And, and so you give yourself to prayer. God, I got, uh, there's nothing I can do. This one's yours. So they reward me for good and hatred for my love. Have you ever done that? You've, 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 done, you've loved someone and they returned around and, and kicked you in the booty? Appoint a wicked man against him. Let an accuser stand at his right hand. When he is tried, let him come forth guilty. Let his prayer be accounted as sin. May his days be few and may another take his office. That's what Peter quoted. I don't see Judas. How is Peter so confident that this is talking about Judas? Psalm 69, 25, may the, I won't read the whole psalm, but verse 25, may there can't be de a desolation, let no one dwell in their tents. He says that talks about Judas. But Peter, the Galilean fisherman, how is he making this confident assertion that that is talking about Judas? I'm going to offer you a, a theory. That's all I can put at this point. But it's based upon biblical principles, so I, I believe it holds water, but I'll give it to you to go test it out yourself. David is a man... He's a boy. He's attending sheep. I told you guys, look, I'm going to readdress this. I've gone down multiple paths here to bring you to Psalm 5, verse 3, okay? How do you watch? How do you watch? And we're bringing up Peter. David is a boy in a field attending the sheep, and according to Veggie Tales, he's picking them back up because they keep falling over. I uh, think it's pretty accurate. And Samuel and God are out somewhere else without David's permission, talking about David's life. We need a man, God says. And I got a man after my own heart. And so Samuel goes to David and goes, you're going to be king. David's like, all right. It's about the extent of it. But God labeled him a man after his own heart. I, I, I think there is so much in that one statement that Peter understood. When Peter reads a psalm of David... He's reading the reflection of the Lord. And so when Peter reads my theory, which hopefully will become my belief real soon, when Peter reads a psalm of David, maybe when he reads all the psalms, he's inserting Jesus' name. You see, here's what happens. I've, I've seen this take place. That people will say, well, Peter and John and, and Paul, they, they just grab an Old Testament text and using it for their, for their advantage, for their writings. There's, there's, it's nonsense. There's nothing that connects them. It's just people just grabbing what they want, you know, fulfilling their, and they walk away from Jesus because they see nonsense. Well, let's, I, I want to talk about it. Is it nonsense? I mean, you just read the psalm. There's no Judas in there. How does Peter get so confidently, so confident about the fact that that's about Judas? I mean, we, well, we have our structured ways of like, well, this is a messianic psalm. Well, not the whole thing, just these three verses. And you know, I was in seminary and I was doing a preaching lab. And I brought up Psalm 34 where it says, none of his bones are broken. I said, oh, y'all, there's Jesus right there. And they laughed me out. I mean, and this is because there's no ability to see Jesus, the Lord God Almighty, in the Old Testament. And so David, a man after God's own heart, although he reflects on his life, is writing the words of Jesus. Hey, I believe the Old Testament was written by the power of the Spirit of God. No word laid out by accident. I believe David's life was led every step by God. So as David writes about himself, he is, he, he is journaling the life of Jesus. And Peter knows this. And so Peter looks at Psalm 109, and it's buried within him, and he makes a decision. We have to replace Judas. Judas' name ain't there. Peter's living off faith. He's living by the power that wrote those words. You take, you take that as far as you want, but we seem way off course. So we come back, and so what, do Peter, what does Peter do? He goes, guys, we have, to, we have to fill the spot. So one of the men, so one of the men who, who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, uh, so Peter says, we have to pick a man who has followed us. 
from day one. Beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken from us. I'm at Acts 1, verse 22. One of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two. Joseph, called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. Two. There's a problem there. Right, who do you pick? We should probably put them through personality tests. Give them the DISC assessment. Right? I mean, we should analyze this from all angles so we don't get the wrong guy. Right? I mean, we can't. Guys, this is going to be an, ap- an apostle. You don't want to screw this up. So what do they do, though? You, if, if you're there, you probably read ahead, and you know. Well, they prayed. They prayed. They oriented their, themselves to the Lord, and they gave the situation to God. You, Lord, you know the hearts. We don't. You know the hearts. Of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. This is their solution. To take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. Okay, they offered their prayer and then they moved immediately. And they cast lots. They flipped a coin. Uh, It was that simple for Peter. And the lot fell on Matthias and he was numbered with the 11 apostles and it's a done deal. That's not watching. Peter watched the entire time. He knew. He, he 100% trusted that the Lord would make the right decision. Joseph, you're out of here! But in our modern day way of thinking, that doesn't cut it, does it? Now, we have to put the guy through some type of test. We should probably interview his spouse. I mean, he should have at least talked to the kid. Does he beat you? Nothing there. They knew the guys, and they left it up to the Lord. They, they had requ- uh, guidelines. They followed us from day one. There's two of them. How do you watch? How do you watch? I'm telling you. It, it's, it's the new life oriented towards God, knowing he will work on your behalf and watching as you do for the FPL, man. Where is he? Where is he? But um, Peter did it in less than five seconds. He was so confident. And sometimes you just have to make a decision in life. And you don't know, but the Lord knows. And this is where prayer does come in. The old man has some value. Groan out, cry out, let it out. And the nude man who leashes the old man says, but we will trust together. We will trust the Lord. And we will take the next step. I mean, uh, some of these set passages will paralyze a man or a woman in fear. I don't know what decision to make. I don't know which is the best one. What's of God? What's of God? And, and the longer you stand on the cliff, the more you become afraid. Trust in the Lord. How it works out for you may be a little bit different than Peter. I don't have a coin on me. But you may have, you know, God may lead you in other ways. But he will lead you in righteousness. I want to give you one ingredient from Psalm 5-7. Let's just bump ahead to verse 7. How do you, how do you get this going in you? All right? How do you feed that new life? How do you feed the trust of the Lord? I'm going I'm to close on this thought. Pull up verse 7 of Psalm chapter 5. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. This is what what David's operating out of. Abundance of love. He knows. He knows he's loved. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down towards your holy temple in the fear of you. Verse 8. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. It starts with you knowing how much you're loved. And you have more love than you know what to do with. He loves you more than you love yourself. An abundance of steadfast love, love that will never be moved. And I'll tell you, 
you will trust the one you know loves you. And the renewal of the mind needs this tossed in it over and over again. How much you are loved. I asked the band to come up. Uh, Sarah, I don't, I don't want to speak for your song, but she did send me a song this week that was written from uh, her situation or the storm. And um, as I listened to it, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was good. It's good. It's good. And um, church, we, uh, we we need to move from a place of wishy-washy Christianity to knowing with everything we are that the Lord is real. He leads us. He guides us. And he makes your, your path straight. And we, we close Psalm 5. For you bless the righteous, O Lord. You cover him with favor as with a shield. How do you watch? How do you watch? It's not a physical activity. It's not a physical exercise. You watch by knowing you're loved. You watch by knowing who the Lord is, your God, your King. You watch by knowing he cares about you more than anything else he's created in this world. You watch by knowing you're in no control. You watch by knowing he listens to you. 